Thank you for tuning in. Um, yeah, we're excited to do this. As John was saying, we've done a bunch of these tours, and uh, I think we did the Philippines earlier this week. And uh, we're excited to to hear about what's going on in Malaysia. Um, I think John was asking you about where you buy microphones. You know what I mean? And that's that's an interest to us. And I th I heard you talk about how you import them. It might be easier to import and pay the tax and duties than to buy domestically. I I I hear that uh, from time to time. But uh, tell me more. What else is happening? Well, what else is happening? Um, obviously, well, I mean, um, our music industry, as in, obviously, I think everywhere around the world, live events was was all shut down. We just, um, yeah. well, over here, we were just uh, allowed to open back up live events on Wednesday. It's like two days ago. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So <laughs> everyone's kind of, you know, um, some people have been waiting for this for a whole year like we've had we've mm. had live music shut down for a whole year already so yeah hopefully mm. things are gonna pick up yeah good yeah i think the same in the states right now uh, just this month um the state that we live in the governor is going to slowly start to lift restrictions and we are seeing um outdoor concerts coming together uh but indoor things like arenas and stadiums are still at 10 percent or 25 alan we're losing you i think from uh internet slow internet alan can uh, yeah i think we, we weren't on the wi-fi are we on the wi-fi now are we clear i think so that sounds much better uh, and by the way um or, go ahead I was going to say, Christina in the chat, uh, mentioned that she was surprised that the Super Bowl happened, but that would never, Americans would die first and, and not have a Super Bowl, I think. Right, right Alan? <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's not, that's not something I'm really culturally connected to here in the United States, but uh, possibly. Um, I think that uh, I think that what you saw in the stadium was uh, cardboard cutouts and uh, you know some actually no there were some bodies there there were some bodies but it was limited yeah okay yeah, yeah. Um, same, same with Malaysia Malaysia have started our football uh, yeah. soccer soccer yeah yeah are you guys, are you guys uh, how are are you getting vaccinations in Malaysia? Yep, they just started rolling out a um, couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Great. Good. Yeah, but it's going to take some time. It's going to be a little bit slow. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I wish good health for everyone. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have uh, our groups together and to be able to meet like this. This is uh, a real... Uh, positive thing for the audio engineering society alan i don't know whether you know but jd in studio 2105 is is uh the head of the aes uh section in malaysia okay and cool we did a uh, i was mentioning we did a, a tour like this uh for george hess and his students at sunway university also in kuala lampur and um, I don't know, uh, is there a distributor for Telefunken microphones in Malaysia? Um, it's hard to say. I, I, you know, it's one of those territories that sometimes gets covered by, by maybe China. I'm going to look that up right now and we'll confirm. And, and um, I'm curious also how many, uh, how many uh, people live in Malaysia? Our population is about 30 million. About 30, 30 million. million, yeah. And, uh, do, any, do any of those people use microphones? <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> you know, ju judging by how things went last year, I think like probably half the population is using a USB mic of one sort or, some, or something. <laughs> well, telephone right? doesn't make USB microphones. Oh, I hope, really... I, hope, I hope they don't. Just to introduce myself, my name is John Crivet. I'm a past president of the International 
AES or Audio Engineering Society. I guess you know that. Uh, I run a Facebook group uh, called Hey Audio Student, which is really for people of all ages because we're all lifelong learners of audio. And um, uh, I teach at a, at a college called Emerson College in Boston, uh, where I live. And uh, in the past, I would bring students about 100 miles away uh, to Telefunken, the Telefunken factory. And uh, we were always treated to a really wonderful tour of the factory. And students could learn much more about microphones. Uh, when the pandemic happened and everything was shut down, I was talking to Alan Venetosh, the director of operations at Telefunken. And I said, Alan, let's do some of these tours for groups all over the world. And uh, we've done tours for groups in India and and the Philippines and Myanmar and Poland and Belgium and Mexico and Argentina and all over Latin America and all over the, the United States and Canada. And we're so thrilled to be able to have the AES section from Malaysia. Uh, JD, thank you so much for setting that up. So I want to introduce you to Alan Venetosh. Alan, the director of operations, you're about 100 miles away from me. You're in between Boston and New York. I don't know whether you guys know where that is. Um, but uh, I'm just going to try to in or spotlight for everyone alan there you are okay so alan you're up there uh i see you've got some really cool microphones on your desk there yes yes so thank you john thank you jd hello everyone in malaysia uh really excited to be here uh, as john was saying we've done many of these tours a lot of them have been for students um but if we have some industry professionals here we can dive in a little bit deeper um I'm gonna go over some of the history of Telefunken and we're gonna talk about um, some of the key components that make up these mics that are on my desk here. We'll work our way through the building. If you guys have any questions at any time, just type them in the chat there and John will, will hit me with them. But yes, to answer your question, John, these are three classic microphones in front of me here on my desk, the, the guts or the internals uh, of the classic AKG C12, the Telefunken or Neumann U47, and then the Telefunken Elam, Elam 251, right? So these three microphones are the flagship to the Telefunken product line now that we make here in the United States. Um, they all have uh, premium capsules, premium vacuum tubes, premium transformers and uh, really good resistors, capacitors, just all, all the best kind of components that we can put together here. Um, I got a call. Besides, the, besides these three microphones, we actually make um, a handful of others, including um, our Alchemy series, which are sort of not replicas, but um, designed in the spirit of these classics as well as um, small diaphragm condensers and some hand, handheld dynamic microphones. Um, all right, so history, let's talk about the history of it, right? So some of you guys are familiar with vacuum tube based microphones. Uh, besides AKG, Neumann and Telefunken, um, there are other many other brands that exist, but our part, part of the story that we're gonna talk about is mainly the relationship between Telefunken, AKG, Neumann and Sennheiser. So part of my role here is to study the history of Telefunken and understand what was going on 50 or 60 years ago. So you can see here in these catalogs that are from the late 1950s that we have both Telefunken um, and AKG, Telefunken, Sheps and Telefunken Neumann branded products. That's because Telefunken actually never really made their own microphones. They were always made by someone like AKG in Austria, who would have made the C12 and the 251, or Neumann, who would have made uh, the U47, right? So um, here's some other old classic marketing materials from Telefunken. They would have also made 
recording consoles and tape machines. But part of our story right now is just to talk about the history of the microphones. Um, something that's really cool to also look at is we have uh, an old price sheet from AKG, right? So you guys might know that some of these vintage mics are going for more than $10,000 now new or even $20,000 on the vintage market. But, you know, a new 414 or a new power supply for a C24 might have been 150 to 250 US dollars when it first came out. So, all right, let's check out some more of the history here. All right, so here in our lab, we have a collection of historic mics that we use as benchmarks for testing and comparison purposes. Uh, what you're looking at over here are some small diaphragm designs that are end address, right? So it's the same capsule, just set up in an end address versus a side address configuration. Uh, on the back of this Telefunken mic, you can see that there is a Sheps logo. So there's an example of a co-branded and co-designed product where Telefunken worked with another company in Europe. These other microphones are like ribbon or carbon or dynamic style designs. Down low, we would have microphones that would basically be the predecessors to the three microphones that I just showed you. So before the U47, before the 251 and before the C12, there were bottle microphones like this, right? And these were designed for broadcast and, um, you know, uh, basically uh, announcement style uh, use. So original Telefunken logo and model number. And if you spin it around here, you can see the person who built and designed this uh, microphone was George Neumann, right? So George Neumann would have went on to make his own famous microphone company called Neumann which are still in uh, production right now and owned by the Sennheiser company. Uh, Neumann microphones, right? We were just talking about those. Here are Neumann microphones that are designed for measurement purposes. So if you look up top here, they kind of have a really interesting looking capsule, right? So this capsule would have been used for frequency response analysis or noise floor testing. Might be something like the equivalent of a modern DPA or Earthworks design. And down low here, we would have our bottle microphones uh, the, that would maybe not be from Telefunken, but from other classic brands, RFT and Siemens. And if you look right here, you can see this is the original Neumann logo. Before it was a diamond badge, it was actually a circle briefly. Okay, enough about the history. Let's go take a look at where we make the microphones. I have one quick question about some of those microphones. They would come out, the ones at the bottom, they, they would come out as line level or microphone level. Okay, yeah, I forgot about to tell you that. So. These, these microphones have two vacuum tubes inside of them. They have like a preamp stage and a bit of a power stage to drive them at line level. Um, so if you were to slide them open, you would see two big steel vacuum tubes. Microphones that put line level out basically went away uh, around the 1940s when things like the U47 uh, or the C12, the U67, things like that started to be introduced. Um, Telefunken did make a, a handful of preamps like the V72, the V76. Uh, we don't do that now, but some of that technology would have migrated out of the microphones into a, uh, a cassette or cartridge style preamplifier like the V72. Okay. So now we are standing in a 8,000 square foot space where we have up to 20 people, 20 technicians building microphones uh, throughout the day. Uh, due to COVID, the crew is a little bit uh, reduced as we are working safely to have social distance happening. But before we show you where the mics are put together, I can show you some of the sub-assembly and the tests, sorry, the tests that we do on what we call sub-assemblies or key components that go into the microphone. For example, vacuum tubes, capsules, and transformers all go through a series of rigorous tests. So in this space here, you can see we're doing vacuum tube 
um, tests. So what we would do is burn in, we would burn in dozens of tubes at a time on a custom um, sort of test plate that we build, right? So these are the tubes from the ELAM 251 or our TF 51. They come over here to uh, a burn in place and then they'd be run under a simulated voltage for a few days to burn in and kind of make sure the noise floor is quiet. Um, so we'll do that with all the tubes that go into our microphones, but we'll also do that with non-vacuum tube-based microphones. Right? These are fat, phantom powered mics that are gonna go and sit in uh, under phantom power for a few days before we test them. So there's a burn-in process that happens with tubes and key components. You can see these are the tubes from our copperhead design. All right, so behind, besides tubes, we're gonna be burning in, I'm sorry, not burning in, testing frequency responsive capsules. So right now, Bobby is working on our TF47, which is like our U47, right? So we're gonna be sweeping all the capsules. This device is a bit of a small anechoic space where we will sweep um, this tone. Go ahead. You can see now on the screen, the frequency response of each capsule. So we have a benchmark that we follow uh, for each design and we have tolerances that we stay within. So show, let's see what a couple of these look like overlaid on top of each other. All right, so you can start to see each capsule come in and this is where we will go and look for matched pairs uh, or read out the bad money. So that's a great example of a matched pair right there. Got this guy, which is a little bit sketchy, so I got to see if I was off axis for the fuzzing, yeah, or if the caps is actually reacting. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a discrepancy up there, and that could just be from it being calibrated slightly wrong. Thank you, Bobby. All right. Um, so there are additional tools that we have here that burn in um, not only or test not only each component, but will also burn in a whole microphone. Uh, so this this system right here actually has no microphones in it today, but if you see what kind of power we're running, you can see that we're basically running phantom power, 48 volts. And we'll put this through um, the microphone that John is actually talking through today. The TF11 would be tested and burned in, in this area. All right. Additional vacuum tube mics being burned in. This will be the TF51. All right, so that's an area where we do one of the phases of testing. There's many tests that we do throughout the production process, but this space is where we build the ELAM 251, the U47 sequel. So the woman who sits here, uh, her job would be to build some of our diamond series mics. So today on the counter, um, looks like we have some cables that are being put together. So this is the cable from our U47. It's completely interchangeable and intermatable with any original vintage Neumann or Telefunken U47. And then you can see microphone bodies coming together here. This would be the U47. It doesn't have the tube in it or it doesn't have the capsule yet, but the structural framework is there. And then, of course, the complete system would look something like this. This system's actually come, come back from Korea, all right? So our, one of our best distributors in Asia um, is in Korea. So they've sent this mic in for repair. That's what you're seeing here. All right, so beside the two, sorry, besides the U47, uh, the 251 is also put together here. So this space uh, would be used for assembling that. And if you took a look at the circuit boards, All right, so the design is a little bit different. It's uh, instead of being stacked up like a C12 or a U47, it's laid out on a circuit board. Um, you have your transformer stashed in the bottom, a uh, resistor, sorry, a big capacitor right here at the bottom, a bunch of resistors up the side, another capacitor here, and then it will mate at the top.
with what we call the switch housing, right? This is the part that's gonna hold the capsule. Capsule is gonna sit up top and then you'll be able to rock the switch back and forth between cardioid, omni, and figure eight. So that's sort of the inside of the one. You can see the head grills, right? The head grills are made in brass. Uh, and get soldered and then they would get plated to a finish like this. All right, power supply production. Let's take a look at power supplies. All the Diamond Series microphones come with a custom power supply to run the, the, the voltage of the tube and also to run the voltage sometimes to the capsule. So this is a basically a generic um, circuit board with a transformer and a series of components. What happens on each side is going to be different and relative to the system that we're building. So if you look right here, this actually is a stereo power supply, right? It's going to be able to power two microphones in at once and two microphones out. Or you could just do one at a time, right? But our telephone can make match stereo sets. Um, and then you would be able to have this for, say, this would power um, two of our Alchemy series mics or my power uh, 251, two of them. Al, I noticed that some of the connections have three pins and some of the connections have seven pins. Could you explain? Yeah, yeah sure. So with the standard XLR that we're all familiar with, like for Phantom Power, that's three pins. So out of a telephone and microphone system, you're going to have your XLR out to your preamp. But the seven pins in are carrying uh, a handful of different things. First of all, they're carrying the positive and the negative audio uh, phase of the audio, as well as a ground, right? So that's three channels. Then there's going to be the fourth channel and the fifth channel are going to be a high voltage and a low voltage for the vacuum tube. Then the sixth channel could actually be a polarizing line, right? It's a voltage that comes from the power supply to the microphone and up into the capsule. Um, so the capsule would then be changed from cardioid to omni to figure eight remotely by carrying a voltage through that line. And the way that that works is with this rotary switch, we have a series of resistors and as you dial the switch, the resistance changes, therefore changing the voltage to the back of the capsule. So then the back of the capsule gets added some voltage. What happens then it becomes omni, right? Because then you're looking front and back, it's a 360 degree sound. Or if you're in cardioid and you knock it to figure eight, you're sending voltage to the back and you're also flipping the phase, right? So then you have bipolar figure eight. So the extra pins in the cable are responsible for carrying the polarizing voltages as well as the high and the low voltages for the vacuum tubes. All right, so we look at the diamond series are the 251, the C12, and the U47. The alchemy series, which I was just showing you in that case, are going to be what we call the TF47, the TF51, and then our copperhead which is either the TF29 or 39. Uh, and this is the space where they would be built. So uh, looking right here, this is the, the TF47, the circuit that Bobby was just testing uh, where the capsule on. So you have a BV8 transformer, the same that goes in our U47, uh, a vacuum tube that would rest right in this mount, and then of course the capsule inside. Over here, we have our copperhead. Uh, so the copperhead is available uh, in a multi-pattern version, or if you see it right here, right, it's a cardioid only version. Uh, this mic is really great on acoustic guitar, vocals, drums, pretty much use it on everything. Um, entry level price is $12.95 for telephone. So Alan, you have, you have this diamond series that I put up in the chat, the Elam yep. 2.1, the U47 and the C12, and those microphones are up near $10,000. But, you know, not everybody can afford a $10,000 microphone. So you make this um, thing, this series called the Alchemy Series, 
which are like somewhere between like one thousand and two thousand dollars. Much more affordable. Uh, what's the difference between these things? Can I, if if I bought a a T forty seven instead of a U forty seven, would would it really voice like a like a U forty seven? We, we try our best, yes. We basically, when we can, we're using all the same components. So similar transformers, similar resistors, capacitors. Um, the capsule's different, right? So on the high-end microphone, all the machining is gonna be done in the United States or in Europe. Um, and all the components are gonna be as premium as they possibly can. With the Alchemy series, we're going to take all those premium components we're, but we're going to match them with metal work or machining that might come from overseas. So we were able to get more affordable metal work from Korea or China. It comes in here raw. And you, as you can see, our team then assembles and puts it all together. So what you're getting physically are going to be, with the Diamond Series, a high-end um, visual replica. Every po component and part in the Diamond Series is interchangeable with a... Uh, original new old stock or old school unit. With the Alchemy series, sonically, you're gonna get there. You're gonna get like 90, 95% there because we're taking the same components, but we're just putting them in this different metalwork. In the end, there is a resonant frequency to the metalwork when it's all put together. And by design, it just is not possible to get that same resonance with this metalwork as it is, say, for the Diamond Series metal. But um, it's very close sonically. It is almost there. So, so Christina had a great question. How different are the tolerances with the $8,000 price differences with outsourced pieces? How different are the tolerances? Uh, I got to be honest with you, not much different. The point that we're trying to show you here is that in this space, where we make the $10,000 mic, we're also making the $200 mic. And in terms of tolerances, are you talking about tolerances for noise floor, for frequency response? There's all different things. So uh, just to drill down on the most important, let's say frequency response. Um, the tolerance for our diamond from mic to mic is critical. It is razor flat and I think it's super consistent from, from unit to unit. By design with our dynamic series, because of how the dynamics are made, it's impossible to have those inconsistent. They all just have to be the same because there's not much mechanical ways for them to be different. Um, the stuff that we're talking about here in the middle, the alchemy series, we may have a wider tolerance acceptable tolerance in the Alchemy series for frequency response. For example, um, we might allow a capsule, the capsule in this, produ in this production batch, if there's 12 or 15 mics here, there might be a 6 dB or 4 dB difference across all the mics, but the frequency response would be the same. And then if we were to go with a matched pair, it would be less than one dB difference. We would never let anything be a match pair that wasn't that tight. So um, Christina said, um, you know, she mentioned when, when I asked that, she said parts. So you take, when you're taking a microphone, you're looking, you're testing the capsule, like we just saw. You're testing the tubes for noise. You're testing the capsule for frequency response. Uh, and then we're gonna see later where you take these microphones actually into the studio once they're assembled and you're doing the sum of the parts and making sure that they sound right. Yep, if, and if you're talking about tolerance for metal work and machining, that's also a totally different uh, topic and um, it's ever evolving here, trying to keep up with it. But uh, with the Diamond Series, it'd be pretty, very, very tight tolerances because we wouldn't want to send a vintage power supplier, or sorry, a new power supplier, a new cable, to someone who had a vintage mic, and then it wouldn't work, right? That would be bad. Let's just talk about small diaphragm really quickly. Uh, you can see here in this tray, um, we have a series of small diaphragm microphones coming together. These all have a vacuum tube in them. We make two designs, one without a tube and one with a tube. Um, but they use the same capsule. The capsule can go on 
both myths sort of like the chefs with the New Orleans style, how they're interchangeable. This would be the solid state version right here. There's no tube in it. Instead, there's a, a, a FET, which is actually hasn't been installed yet. In this picture. Alan, for folks who might not know, uh, what's the difference between a microphone with transistors versus a microphone with a tube? Uh, well, mechanically and sonically, I'll, I'll do my best to break that down. Let's get out of the way of the fan. Uh, so vacuum tubes were first, right? This is what was there to um, drive the circuit and match the impedance properly between what they had developed as a capsule. Uh, vacuum tubes have a little bit more self noise to them. So there's a shh kind of happening in the background. However, with the vacuum tube comes an enhanced, har enhanced harmonic richness, uh, some really great overtones that get introduced uh, depending on what your source is. And um, they're just uh, something a little bit more pleasing with the even order harmonic distortion happening with a tube. So sonically tubes have more character, more color, more saturation. Uh, with a FET design, a phantom power circuit, something with a field effect transistor, you are looking at critically flat self noise, critically quiet, if it's really done well, almost sterile. And that is good. Um, if you're looking for something that's very, if you're looking to produce something really low self noise, solo instrument, solo cello, violin, or something. Um, so, phantom powered mics uh, were introduced by Neumann, that design, I think, was a Neumann patent. And that helped them when trying to put as many microphones out in front of an orchestra huh? or a choir, they didn't need to use all the all the um, extra power supplies that were just able to run fancy power around them. So two mics have more color, more saturation, more character. Phantom power or FET mics are more neutral, more natural, more sterile, more critical. All right, so I showed you where we make large diaphragm and small diaphragm condensers. Um, we had, oh, I forgot to show you one thing. This is where we make our newest microphone, the TF11, all right? So you're seeing a batch production with TF11 right now. And Kevin is doing uh, some soldering. Any of the circuit boards. See above his head, system right here. So this microphone is Telefunken's first large diaphragm, solid state phantom powered mic. It's Street price is $89.95, and that's the mic that John's been talking to you through. In addition to the dynamic mics, I'm sorry, the phantom powered mics, we make dynamic mics, right? The N80 and the N81. Um, again, we are doing all of this in the United States in terms of assembly and uh, testing and finish. We get the body tube from Korea, the head grill also either from Korea or China, uh, and then the circuit is basically painted and or tested or assembled here. You can see these are some wood design. I went and chopped down a tree earlier yesterday morning and hand whittled all these. Just kidding. But we do a custom shop. So either our M80 or our M81 can be finished in all sorts of different colors. Um, gold, gold, all the solid primary colors uh, of the rainbow. And, uh, we also make the M82, uh, which you can see right here. The M82 is a M82. large diaphragm dynamic microphone. It's an end address so that you can speak to it towards the end. It can be used for broadcast or kick drum applications. On board has an EQ filter switch where you can cut some low mids or add a high boost. And then we also need wireless and short versions of the M80 and M81 for drum and uh, horn applications. And you can see John is uh, soldering a few up right now. Nice. Ooh, I like your, I'll look at this up here. 
this is vibing, all right? This is a nice little vibe up here. Come to Telefunken Pineapple Chill Out, man. All right. <laughs> hey, man. Okay, uh, you can see more of our production here for a dynamic series. Um, and we do another, we do have another uh, frequency analysis space here. We call this the Lunar Lander. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, a homemade brew, but same process, we would put capsules up inside here and we would fire frequency response down and then we would test uh, everything related to the dynamic series. And actually these are some of the capsules. They're all labeled and um, serial numbered and tested. So this would be the large diaphragm dynamic capsule from the M82. All right, how are we doing on time? We're doing pretty good. Uh, we're 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 actually doing excellent. Now you don't have the all the microphones set up, so we can. I see. didn't. I had I had to move them, but I can show you what we're doing in the sound stage right now. There might you know, be some set up there today. I'll tell you what would be interesting: uh, the difference between a an M eighty and an M eighty one. Sure. Like you you described. Check. Yeah. So. Uh, Grab one of these. Pop over here. So, right here, this this is a bit of like a frequency plot of this. This is a frequency plot of the Alchemy series, actually. And I just want to explain this first before I talk about the M80s and the M81. There are three voices in the Alchemy series. This red line is our copperhead, right? It's got a hyped low end and a hyped top end. It's sort of a bit of a EQ, a smiley face EQ. The green line is going to be our, T, our TF51. It follows the frequency plot of a 251 where it's razor flat with a little bit of a presence boost here. Then the blue line is going to be our TF47 where it's pretty flat, has a mid range push, and then it has a rolled off top end. Those are the three voices of the alchemy. You were asking about what the M80 and the M81 do. In a similar fashion, if I were to show you these on, on, a, on a plot, the M80 would be very bright. It would probably be something similar, not like the red line, but it would be probably something similar to the green line right here, where the M81 would be something similar to the blue line. So the M80 is very bright, open, clear sounding dynamic. It might be one of the brightest dynamics in the industry, where the M81 is very flat, dark and neutral, almost like a ribbon microphone, but it's a very neutral dynamic. So when you're buying a mic from Telefunk and you have the option to buy a very bright open dynamic or a flat and neutral dark dynamic, where something like the SM57 or 58 or the, uh, you know, the Sennheiser 835 is falls sonically more in the middle. All those mics are actually really great microphones. Uh, the Telefunk has bookend the sonic spectrum of the All right, so you can see the space from the other direction. Our team builds microphones over here. We have um, our parts storage in this area. So as they're building mics, they just run and grab stuff. Um, we have a massive collection of all the components that would be needed to do restoration on vintage microphones. So we're doing repairs on AKG, Neumann, Sennheiser from time to time. Um, and then we would store our, our metalwork, our machining, right? I don't have a machine shop to show you here. There's no lathe, there's no mill. Um, we get our metalwork from machine shops either down the street in town, like this. This is the American uh, machining for um, the connector on a, on a C12, or, or sorry, U47. Or these are the parts from the inside of our power supply that would get stamped and machined uh, in the state. Parts of our Elam, oh, oh, Elam 251 uh, base connector. All right, so, and uh, our team is uh, doing final fulfillment for packaging with microphones. Ben right here is packing up our small diaphragm M60s on their way out to a dealer. All right, so that's the lab where we build the microphones. Let's take a look to see what else we got here in the building. We had a, a great question as you're walking, Alan, 
Uh, Mode uh, asked, any history on the three frequency response reference? Did you just, I, I, I don't know what that, are you asking is did did they test those microphones did they look at a frequency response graph from the 1950s or oh so uh, we we we, ha we have all that um those plots that you were just looking at um we have we have three different zones in the building that do frequency analysis we have something called fuzz measure uh, we have something called gold line and that plot uh, was done probably a year ago for marketing uh, to demonstrate the three different sounds of that series. But we would take all the vintage mics that we have in our building and run them through the same systems to create benchmarks and have an understanding of what those things should and be like. So you kind of mentioned the history of those frequency plots. Like, yes, we have old plots that were given to us or that we bought with vintage mics. We have new plots that we make here in house. And then we have po both polar, uh, which is 360 degree polar and a linear, um, just frequency response done by third party, outside third party people to help us uh, when needed. Uh, and actually I'll show you now where we do some of the critical um, frequency analysis testing uh, for our capsules, our CK12 capsules. Check it out. All right, so there's nobody in here today, uh, but if there were, they would be building and working on our CK12 capsule, right? This right here is the heart and the soul of our it's actually an Elam 251T capsule, right? This is the CK13, the titanium alloy finish. You can see it's not actually reflecting in brass, but more of a mirror look where these are in brass. Okay, see the two differences between those membranes right there? All right, so C12, CK12 is historically accurate with a gold sputter diaphragm where the C13 has a titanium alloy hybrid spread across the diaphragm. So what is inside of a CK12 capsule can be seen right here, right? These are the back plates that are the insides. These are the outer rings that attach to the diaphragm. So this back plate gets hit with an electrical charge. It gets suspended uh, with this ring and this diaphragm over it that also gets hit with an electrical charge. And the sound pressure that changes in between this plate and that chamber is what basically becomes the sound that gets picked up uh, in the microphone. It's the exact opposite mechanical function of a speaker right and this is a one-sided version that will pick up cardioid the minute you add a back plate to it and another ring you now have a dual-sided capsule which can be charged you can get cardioid omni figure eight and all the stages in between because it's a double-sided capsule okay so that is basically the theory on how a CK12 capsule comes together. Here it is right here. It has a lead off the front, or sorry, uh, off the front ring and a lead off the side. And this is called an edge terminated design. And that's what the Austrians would have done in AKG. All right, so what we have here is a heavily damaged Neumann M7 style capsule, right? This capsule has no leads coming off the side, just a lead right through the middle. So it's called a center terminated style design. This has a better mid-range focus where this style capsule has a little bit more extended lows and extended highs. Both of these designs are about 70 years old where this design right here is what is more commonly being used in Neumann and Sennheiser production today as well as companies like Rode. Um, so this is 
a center is a um, center terminated design, but also has an edge termination. So it's doing both jobs of both these into, into one design. So if you bought a Neumann U87 or something, that's what this capsule would be like. So the main difference between these two Neumann style capsules and the AKG or Austrian style C12 is that the closer you get to this capsule, the, low, the more the, you know, the more proximity effect builds up, the more low end will build up. So you can get really, you, know, you can get a really big radio voice getting right in front of that mic, hey, bang 97X, the future of rock and roll. You get that really big sound out of that. So this is where we make the CK12 capsules. Let's show you where we make the rest of the stuff here. This space is where our design engineers would be developing new product or developing all the test procedures to make, uh, to make our testing and our assembly happen, right? So right now there's nobody here, but if you look, uh, this per the person who sits here would be doing our computer automated design in our CAD drawing. So right now on his screen, there is a new uh, a wooden box that's being drawn up, uh, which would be this wooden box right here, something very similar. It would hold like say the U47 or the 251. Uh, that's what he was working on yesterday. But the kind of things that happen here, you know, he'd be using calipers to do lots of different measurements. And he would be doing design work where he would be taking a schematic transferring it over to a, a component drawing on a circuit board, and then transferring that into a design uh, in CAD or SolidWorks, which would then end in a new microphone, right? The TF-11. So Ryan sits here and that would be his job. Um, all right, additional projects and processes that happen in this space are related to critical testing, um, and noise analysis. So right here, um, this setup is doing a sweep on a FET circuit. So this is our small diaphragm microphone. There's no capsule set up right now. And we're doing a frequency analysis of just the circuit, right? To see how flat it is. Um, this company, Audio Precision, that makes test equipment has sent us this device to set up and listen to. We wouldn't really do a test like this except we're just demoing what they send out. Um, so we're excited to see what this can do for us in the future. Um, let's look over here at some prototypes. Uh, here is an example of how we might go about prototyping something. Okay, we have three unique microphones here, sorry, three of the same design um, ex externally, but internally they're unique, they're all different. And we would take these and hand them to our lab team or, our, or, a, or a professional a sound engineer, or audio engineer to give feedback without telling them what is inside, right? So we do blind shootouts and blind tests. Um, and I think what we have going on here is a test for a new phantom power mic with a uh, K47 style capsule, which is kind of like a Neumann style design. So at some point this spring, we'll probably send these out on the road or to a studio locally for some feedback and do that a few times and then get, take that feedback to make the final decision on what we would do with the microphone for the next microphone design. Uh, over here, a uh, similar process where we have um, maybe a donor or a dummy body with a sample capsule and we're just going through and we're auditioning um, as many of the same type of component, as many transformers as possible to see what they sound like and to see if they're consistent with each other before we decide to use them uh, for a production run. All right, so um, I want to I want to pass along a compliment. Uh, we hear, uh, I appreciate the camera person getting nice and close so we can see the detail and sharp focus. So give it up for our camera. Yeah. <laughs> Here, let's Thank look at, you, you want to bug out on some other stuff? Look at this stuff for a second. You can fly over all these goodies. So over here would be where we're testing, um, 
like things that might not have to do with the sound, but we might be testing the finish. Like um, this is a color that we didn't use or over here, we didn't know which color red was the right color to choose. Uh, so we're made of, you know, we're trying to decide or here we are drilling down really closely on some historic Neumann um, swivels and knuckles on cables to decide, you know, you know, what happened to the finish? Why is it, why is this finish breaking down, but this finish different? What happened, you know, over time? So yeah, thanks for the camera comment. Nick's been working on it. All right, we're gonna- Another great question from Christina, really quick. Uh, do you have a cool story of an old microphone coming in for repair that gave you new information to enhance the original quality of that history? Yes, for sure. Um, I'll say that within recent times, no, but 15 to 20 years ago, I have very, very clear memories of us receiving microphones from the Rolling Stones, Keith Richards, microphones from Peter Gabriel. Uh, but the one that helped us the most was uh, Lenny Kravitz. Um, Lenny Kravitz sent us a historic U47 one time that we were, able to, we, were, we were able to take some serious measurements off of and make a couple final decisions on. Uh, but this was, this was 15 years ago. Now we still get vintage mics and what we're doing is, is um, we're retrofitting them back to vintage because vintage mics at this point are so old that at some point in the 80s or the 90s, they might have been modified to some sort of life support level with a different tube or a different component just to get them by. But now, 70 years later, we've actually recreated all that old stuff again. And we're bringing microphones from their modifications back to original spec. And that is sometimes a fun thing to learn about as well. Um, all right, we need to take a two minute break or not even that 30 second break right now. Nick is gonna switch over our Wi-Fi, so please. I'll, I'll uh, do a little dance while we're waiting for them to switch over the Wi-Fi. Uh, is, are we going too fast? Are we going too slow? Is this, are, are you learning new things? Uh, is it, is it, are we insulting your intelligence by being too basic? Um, uh, I, we're very happy to have you here. And, and, um, I po just want to say, I posted a few things. I have a link, uh, where there are things like discounts for the microphones. And there's also something called live from the lab where they record all kinds of music groups that come in. And there are multi-tracks that you can you download and use for practice in mixing um, that are available that are linked to that. So you can do any of those things. Um, so Alan, you are back. Yeah. So now, now where we are, um, we're we're on the sound stage in the marketing side of the facility. I'm going to show you our recording studio and uh, the space where we film our live from the lab series. Um, live from the lab, live from the lab.net. Write that down, check that out. Live from the lab.net is a YouTube channel that we've had here for seven or eight years now. Um, there are over 160, 170 live performances that videos that have been hosted. Um, they are live performances of bands using uh, exclusively Telefunken microphones that we film here in our sound stage. And you can download. Um, the, the videos and the audio files from those performance, and you can mix them on your own in your own space. Uh, so for example, uh, just on the screen right now is, is, a, is a kind of a fun, fun jam here. Uh, so we're having some problems with the internet. The sound is through. No sound. It wasn't coming through the video from the video. Is it now? Oh, really? It's intermittent. Gotcha. All right. Well, here's the deal. What you're looking at right now is our control room where we're um, doing all of our testing by day of all of our vacuum tube based and condenser microphones. There is a human being who sits in here and listens to every microphone that we make, puts them through a mechanical and a physical test. Uh, and then besides that, that uh, our technician does all of the live recording and mixing from our live from the lab 
um, series. So some of this equipment you may recognize, it's a bit crowded in here, but you can sort of see we have um, the, all sorts of compressors and limiters uh, from the LA-2A, the 1176, the Distressor, the DBXs, API. Um, we're running a Pro Tools 32 channel Avid rig um, and the API 1608 console in the center. We have our Rupert Neve satellite summing mixer that helps us do um, you know, summing 32 channels analog. And then just a big pile of vintage Neve, Grace, Avalon, Siemens, we test everything with Grace Design Threes, and we're pretty loyal to them. So, most every one of our, most all of our microphones will be listened to through that noise, self noise, frequency response, and phase will all be logged uh, here in the system. All right, um, we have lots of other microphones here at Telefunken outside of our own, right? So, oh, it looks like we're locked here today. We'll come back to this in a second. We're locked there. Uh, let me show you the sound stage. Can you unlock the mic cabinet? All right, this is the sound stage where we would be doing the filming from the live from the lab series. Uh, we have a, a recording session that we're setting up for this weekend. It's actually a rock and roll band um, that's coming to film a demo because they're looking to uh, make uh, a press kit for playing weddings here in the United States. So let's just take a look at what we're about to have set up here. Um, so on lead vocals, um, we were gonna have the M80, right? So that'll probably be for both male and female. Um, besides the lead vocal, we'll probably put the M81 on backing vocal. Uh, and then it looks like down here, there'll be a synthesizer or a keyboard. So we have Telefunken Stereo Direct Box, which we also make here. I didn't, I didn't show you that. Um, over on guitar or bass, it looks like we're gonna have a large diaphragm condenser copperhead. And then over here, one of my favorite all-time combos, the Royer 121 ribbon microphone with the Telefunken M80, really can't, can't beat that. And then looks like we'll have a, a direct box for backup here. Um, okay, for drums, looks like the drums are incomplete, but we would have on kick, uh, looks like we have a prototype. Oh, this is fun. All right, so right now, this is a prototype microphone. I don't really know what it is, but it, it's a, a Fet All right, so it's a FET 47 prototype. It, it, I showed you this, these mics a couple minutes ago in the other lab. So we're going to be sampling and demoing this tonight with the band. Um, down on the floor right there, that's the M81 for snare. I'm sorry, the M80 for snare, and then the M81 uh, for high toms, and now the M82 on floor tom. We'll have our M60s on hi-hat and ride. And then up top, we will put our TF11s for overhead. Little bass guitar. The M82 on the cabinet. And then our direct box up top here. And lastly, looks like we're gonna have a horn section. Uh, that saxophone and percussion. Oh, saxophone. So and sax is on the 47 and Burke's going to be on the TF-11. All right. So percussion will be over here on the TF-11 and then saxophone on the TF-47 right here. So that's our sound stage. If you go to livefromthelab.net, you'll be able to see all the performances and download stuff. Um, yeah, we'll show you the rest of our microphones over here. All right, so we have to know about every brand and we have to know what's going on about all microphones. So besides our current production, we're going to have everything from AKG to Brauner to Neumann. So the U40, sorry, the U87, the M149, the FET47, Audio-Technica, great company from Japan, some additional Neumann, mics from Cascade and Sennheiser and Sure. And then over here, dynamic microphones, right? Uh, lots of the classics, the 421s, the 441s, the Sennheiser 409s, RE, RE20 by Sen, uh, Electro Voice. This is a 
the original AKG D12E and then the AKG D112 side by side here. Um, old school AKG PML Royer. This is a predecessor to the Sure SM7. We have the SM5B. And then up top here, this is one of my favorite um, things to show people. This is an example of how Sennheiser used to make microphones for Telefunken, right? So Sennheiser made the 421. It was distributed all over the world, but there might've been a distribution agreement with Telefunken for a couple countries. So in this case, you have the same microphone, one's branded Telefunken, one's branded Sennheiser. All right. So we also have, you know, we have tons of other microphones, a whole back line here in the studio. Uh, if you were coming from out of state or out of the country and you wanted to demo a demo, a 251 or a U47, we could do that here. We have people fly in. Prior to COVID, we had people coming in all the time. I'm sure once COVID is passed, we'll, we'll start that again. But. So, Alan, you're a, you're a hundred miles from New York. So if someone's in New York and they're interested in hearing some microphones or, you know, I mean, if you're going to spend $10,000 on a microphone, it's not a bad idea to check it out. <laughs> right, and, right. Yeah, it's, a, and, you know, we have dealers all over the world, but coming to our shop to test is probably, you know, you're not gonna be able to go to a dealer and test. So unless you, unless you were like right in their shop and you can go and do it, but I don't know if they have a studio set up the same way we do. So, so I guess this is sort of the end here. Does anyone have any questions for Alan? Uh, besides, how cool is that bus? Uh, if you want to unmute, you can do that. Well, Christina, who's had wonderful questions, we're going to give you an award for the best questions. With so many people being remote, uh, will you look at pivoting to high-end home mics for podcasting or more in-home Zoom music creation? I, I don't know how to really answer that. Um, due to COVID, we the demand for our current production line far exceeds what we're even capable of right now. So thinking or dreaming about new products is just a, too far off the table for us at the moment. We're just staying focused on trying to build the mics that we currently make. But to answer, I, I get why you're asking that. And for sure, we've seen all of our competitors scramble to get into that market. Um, right now, there is, no, there is no plans for us, but we recognize that there is for sure an emerging area to deal with there. But I think I want to point out also that you guys are really smart in that you, you do what you do really well. You do, you know, you, you mostly really stick to these high end, uh, it's very artisanal. It's uh, it's really about high quality, and 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 that's what what Telefunken does. There are other microphones that might, you know, churn out lots of lots of inexpensive microphones, but of much lesser quality. So I so I applaud the fact that you stick with making really great microphones. I think that that's terrific. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chi uh, Xiao uh, had a great question. What is your first choice of a mic for kick drum? Uh, well, we recommend the M82 that we make uh, for inside the kick or right on the, the lip. And I honestly really like um, our TF47 um, out in front of the drums uh, for kick as well. Um, I think uh, also our Copperhead could, could be a good kick drum mic for sure. Yeah. So the M82 is very similar to like an uh, Electro Voice uh, RE20 that you have um, switches that, that boost or cut the high and low frequency. Correct. So you can use it as a podcast mic. You could use it as a kick drum mic. Um, dynamic moving coil. Great. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Alan? I know it's late, late, late where you are, and it is early, early, early. Alan, I don't even know if you've had coffee yet. I don't drink coffee, but thank you. Jeff. I don't know if you've had coffee, but people love your camera work, so thank you. Hey, you know what? Uh, I, I got to get these guys back to work. 
they've uh, let's he give it up for uh, Nick, our cameraman, and Alan. Um, uh, folks from uh, Malaysia, uh, we love you. We care about you. We want you to stay healthy. We want you to keep making really great music and um, and record and broadcast wonderful things. Uh, please, uh, you know, I put in uh, in the chat the link where there are all kinds of um, uh, uh, information about Live from the Lab and about discounts and all kinds of things like that. And uh, you can follow along also on the Hey Audio Student Facebook group uh, for more information. From time to time, we run contests, giveaways for uh, Telefunken microphones and all kinds of information about uh, new things. So, Alan, thank you so much, JD. Thank you so much, and uh, and and uh, Christina and everyone else. We're so appreciative of all your great questions, uh, and and we're gonna say goodbye. Good night to everybody. We'll see you uh, hopefully sometime soon. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, guys. All right. All right. Okay. Take care. Good night.